Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. My name's Tom Harvard and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harvard, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 pm on GB News, the People's Channel. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good morning, it's 9.30 and this is The Briefing with me, Emily Carver, on your TV and radio. I'll be standing in for Tom Harwood this morning and bringing you all the latest from the world of politics. But first, let's go to your morning news. A very good morning. It's 9.31. I'm Rosie Wright. Let's get you up to date. Further strike action has been announced on the railways over Christmas as union leaders rejected offers to end their walkouts. The RMT isn't happy with an offer from Network Rail of an 8% pay rise over two years. Members will now walk out for eight days this month, four times next week, and then from Christmas Eve until the 27th. Antibiotics could be given to children at schools affected by strep A infections as a preventative measure. The Education Minister, Nick Gibb, told GB News it's one of their options to manage the infection in schools with a reported case. Nearly 700 more infections were reported in one week in November compared to the same time last year. Eight children have died from the infection since September. The Labour Party is warning that millions of people are struggling to book a GP appointment, saying some won't have serious medical conditions diagnosed until it's too late. Patient survey data shows nearly 14% of patients in England could not get an appointment the last time they tried to book one. Well, the Department for Health and Social Care says they're working to improve access so everyone who needs an appointment 
can get one within two weeks. Grocery inflation's dropped for the first time in almost two years. Data from Kantar shows in the four weeks to November, inflation was at 14.6 per cent. That is down 0.1 per cent from October. The market researcher, though, says the average cost of a shop is still £60 more than this time last year and the price of some produce like milk and butter are still rising. The American actress Kirstie Alley has died of cancer aged 71. She was best known for her role as Rebecca Howe in the sitcom Cheers and her role in the romantic comedy Look Who's Talking alongside John Travolta. In a tribute, Travolta said his time with her represented one of the most special relationships he'd ever had. We're on your TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. It's GB News. Now let's head back to the briefing with Emily. Good morning, it's 9.30 and this is The Briefing with me, Emily Carver, on your TV and radio. So, the RMT union has announced even more rail strikes for December after negotiations with Network Rail failed to find a solution to the ongoing pay dispute. The new walkout will begin at 6pm on Christmas Eve and continue until 6am on the 27th of December. The union has said it will allow its members to vote on whether to continue the strikes in an electronic referendum this week. But they recommend, of course, that they proceed. Joining us now is political editor of the Huffington Post, Kevin Schofield. Kevin, do you think Mick Lynch, or Mick Grinch, as some people are calling him, risks losing public sympathy? I think it is a fine line, really, that, that the union have to tread now. I think um, up until now, there's been largely quite um, reasonable public sympathy and support for the uh, action that the union is taking. They think that they have a case in terms of um, a pay increase. Um, however, I think once you start to impinge on people's Christmas plans, um, particularly people who want to you know, travel across the country on Christmas Eve uh, to see loved ones who they may not, may not have seen for quite some time, then I think um, that is when they are running the risk of public opinion turning. And that could be quite um, ominous for the union because I think once they lose public support, then it becomes much more difficult for them to use strikes as a form of leverage of trying to get more money out of their employers. Christmas, of course, it's the economy. Uh, much of the economy relies on people being able to use our railways. The Nighttime Industries Association said its members took a 40% hit on strike days. I imagine that is going to be much more during the Christmas period when people, of course, are more likely to be spending money, buying gifts, going for drinks, having Christmas parties and whatnot. I do wonder whether the RMT needs to be more honest with its members and actually say that further strike action could be self-defeating. It seems to me that they're clinging on to what one might say archaic working practices and not moving with the times. Would you accept that? Uh, I'm not sure I would, to be honest. I mean, the, the, the union members are obviously balloted. They are in full possession of the facts when they take part in those um, ballots and so far anyway they have overwhelmingly supported industrial action. I just wonder whether the longer we go into this industrial dispute whether the impact of strikes um, is as serious as it has been up until now. You know there's not many other um, bullets in the gun if you want to put it like that as far as the unions are concerned. Obviously it's been a very long-running dispute and um, Mick Lynch has said that if needs be they will continue the industrial action well into next year. Um, I think the longer it goes on, the more difficult it will be, I think, for both sides to come together and reach an agreement. And the bad blood as well that's been um, stored up over this lengthy dispute, I think that's going to take a long time to go away. Now, there's been a very different approach by the new, inverted commas, government. Um, certainly the new Transport Secretary, Mark Harper, has been much more willing to engage, I think, directly with the union and one of his predecessors, Grant Shapps. But thus far, that hasn't seemed to have worked either. So I wonder whether, you know, um, causing such disruption over Christmas may well be the last throw of the dice as far as the union is concerned. And as I say, that is dangerous for them if public opinion starts to turn.
Yes, I think the whole of the public want to see a resolution as quickly as possible. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. That was Kevin Schofield, who is the political editor of the Huffington Post. Now we're going to be moving on. Former Health Secretary Matt Hancock has released a book today by the title Pandemic Diaries, the Inside Story of Britain's Battle Against COVID. They're exciting. The book will reflect on Hancock's time as Health Secretary for three years during the COVID-19 pandemic. This comes after Hancock finishing third place in this year's series of ITV reality show I'm a Celebrity, which led to him losing the whip for participating. Uh, for uh, joining us now is political commentator Stephen Carlton Woods. Stephen, what do you make of this new book Good then? Morning, Sorry, say again. What do you what do you make of this new book? Well, I've not had the luxury of looking through it yet, but obviously I've heard snippets of it, and there's been quite a bit made about it in the press. But um, I think he's every right to give his account of what happened when he was in the job. Uh, but even though it doesn't fit the um, the narrative of the mainstream media, uh, they really don't like it, him having his say. So I just find it very bizarre, really. I think the best thing to do is people to buy the book, read it, and make up their own minds. But it's only a short time away now. We'll have a, a full inquiry into the uh, COVID and the lockdown situation, how the government handled that anyway and then we can all make our own mind about it who was right Stephen, and who you're was doing his uh, you're doing uh, doing his pr for him telling people to go out and read the book i know that part of it is already published in the daily mail so people can get a sneak peek at least as it is i my concern is that we're going to get sort of half truths uh, sort of in a Meghan and harry style he's going to be expressing his truth sort of is trying to manipulate public opinion before that inquiry reveals all well, I think he's every right to do that. And as I say, it doesn't fit the narrative of some of the mainstream media, and they really don't like this. Uh, I mean, I find it interesting because there's big questions around going into lockdown in the first place. Should we have done it? And we're finding things out now as bits of information drip through that maybe we shouldn't have gone in so soon. But don't forget at the time, all eyes were on each country around Europe was watching each other, who was going to make the first move. Italy went into not lockdown first. We had all them terrible things happening in Spain. And people didn't know which way to turn. It was a very difficult situation. He was at the helm of all this at that time. And he's being criticised from every side mm. for going into lockdowns, for not doing enough, having an affair. You know, all these different little things. So uh, yeah. he's got his little... It's still his world and, you know, the world according to Matt Hancock at that time. You can't really dispute it. The world, according, the world according to Matt Hancock. I um, have read that one of his, uh, one of the things that he's going to say in the book or has said in the extracts already is that we should have locked down sooner. And that was one of his major regrets. Now, that, of course, uh, will upset many people, many people watching uh, this show today who were extremely anti-lockdown. Um, as you say, he, this certainly won't appeal to all, will it? Well, no, well, we had Dan Wotton last night on his show criticising Matt Hancock because he was one of the people who didn't want any lockdown whatsoever. And, uh, you know, I, I could share that view a little bit. I mean, I spoke to many people. And at the time, the mainstream media had this narrative that we must have a lockdown. All the experts that were getting in were all saying the same thing. People like Carl Hennigan were excluded from the likes of the BBC because he didn't fit their narrative and he was saying all the things contrary to what they wanted to get across to the public. So we had all this going on in the early days, and now we're all questioning, should we have locked down? But I think the main point of all this, and my criticism of the government at the time, was they were too busy, worried about what the media were saying and what the opposite benches were saying. And uh, if you take your eye off your backbenches, it causes you trouble, as we've seen. Yes, I think there's quite a lot of revisionism among the public as well. If we cast our minds back to those first few months of the pandemic, there was absolute mass media hysteria, also public hysteria as well. There was so much pressure on the likes of Matt Hancock to do something. And if I'm sympathetic at all, it is that it was an extremely difficult position to be in as a health secretary. And so we must at least appreciate that, even though we don't agree Agree with some of the measures that he took. Absolutely. Now, one quick uh, question, just to finish off. Apparently, many celebrity pals snubbed 
the launch event last night, which was held at the London Science Museum. Do you think his reputation uh, is still very much tarnished and it's going to take a lot more than a reality TV show and a barrel book uh, to uh, save him? Well, he's up against it. You've got the left that are going to hate him no matter what, just because he's a Tory. Yeah. And then you've got the people on the right that didn't want the lockdowns and they're going to hate him. Uh, it's going to go on. He's, he's up against it. But, I mean, what really surprised me is how well he did in the jungle. He came third. And the papers the next day, Matt Hancock booted out. Well, actually, no, he achieved third place. So it's all about the headlines and how they portray it. And, uh, you know, conversations you have with certain people, you know what newspapers they read. Yes, perhaps the great British public are far more forgiving uh, than media commentators and presenters on GB News. Who knows? Thank you very much, Stephen Carlton Woods, Thank you very much, uh, political commentator. Thank you for joining us this morning. So we're going to be moving on to Scotland. The Scottish National Party are holding an annual meeting today to decide on its new leader in Westminster. The former SNP Commons leader, Ian Blackford, resigned, of course, from the position last week after a five-year tenure. Blackford, who continues as MP for Ross Sky and Lock Harbour said he had accepted a role at the heart of the SNP's independence campaign instead. His replacement is expected to appear at PMQs tomorrow. With me now is Member of the Scottish Parliament for West Scotland, Russell Findlay. Thanks, <coughs> Russell. Ian Blackford's departure, uh, did he jump before he was pushed? Uh, yes, he did. He had a ski and do deep between his shoulder blades, blades uh, put there by Stephen Flynn and his lads club who apparently all play football and have a curry every Tuesday night and they've decided that uh, Blackford Sturgeon's man in London was no longer fit for purpose. The uh, candidate who is going to win the leadership do you reckon? Uh, well, I'd like to pretend I particularly cared, but like most people, they don't. I think tonight I'll be watching the World Cup at 7 o'clock, not uh, wondering about the latest SNP psychodrama. But, you know, the, the, the preferred candidate for Sturgeon and Murrow, who, let's face it, run everything and are complete control freaks, is Alison Thewlis. It appears that she's been pushed forward to counter and head off Flynn at the pass. They don't want Flynn. They want someone they can control, and that is presumably Thewlis. Well, this is a problem for the SNP, is it not? For Nicola Sturgeon, at least. It does seem that there are rebellions brewing, not least on the trans issues, which, of course, have been very controversial, um, the issue of self-identification and whatnot, and also in terms of where they go with the independence movement. Yeah, absolutely. This is a party where... Everybody wakes up in the morning and all that matters is breaking up the UK. They're an anti-UK pressure movement. They're not really a normal political party. And as you say, with the trans issue, with Nicola Sturgeon's bizarre and dangerous quest to bring in self-ID and not listen to the concerns of women about safety of women and girls, um, many of their parliamentarians in Edinburgh and in London have had enough and have stood up quite rightly against this dangerous ideology. Um, the, then we've got the issue of independence. Now, you know, the Supreme Court could not have been clearer. They've told the SNP that the Scottish Parliament, as everybody knew, does not have the powers to hold another referendum. The people of Scotland do not want another referendum. They want to see the Edinburgh government fixing Scotland's many problems and working with our other government in London to do so. Now, what happens in Scotland in terms of the Conservatives in Scotland? It doesn't seem like they're going to be picking up... You are going to be picking up too many votes as it is. How does it do the Scottish Conservatives get the Scots back on side? Well, you know, there's this determination to... Uh, pe people, many in the media, have never accepted the Scottish Conservatives being the second largest party at Holyrood, both in the previous election and indeed the one before that. We are the only party who are quite clear that we will stand up to the SNP and stand up for the union. Just look at the latest stuff coming from Labour. Yet more uh, attempts to appease the SNP with all sorts of strange uh, schemes and, and ideas coming from Gordon Brown. It's the same old stuff. People in Scotland understand that the Conservatives 
in Scotland under Douglas Ross with his team are absolutely determined to stand up for Scots and for our place in the UK. Thank you. Thank you very much, Russell Findlay. I'm off to Scotland this weekend, so I will enjoy the beautiful scenery that, of course, was yeah. member yeah. of the Scottish Parliament for West Scotland, Russell Findlay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Now, there's a war brewing in Cornwall and people calling it an invasion. No, I'm not talking about a swarm of locusts or an influx of Londoners. It's Greg's, the popular bakery chain, and it is opening its doors in Truro today. And it's also threatening to give the humble Cornish pasty a run for its money. Our southwest of England reporter, Jeff Moody, went out to find out what sort of reception Truro's newest store is receiving in a county that's proud of its pasty. On a high street in Cornwall's capital, an interloper has snuck in and set up shop. Greg's opens today, offering a tantalising selection of baked goods from sausage rolls to, well, pasties. And that's the problem. The locals have described the opening of Greg's in quite colourful terms. Some people are saying that it's an invasion, that it's an all-out war. It's even been described as the spawn of the devil. But that's not the view I'm hearing here in Truro. It's champion, mate, why not? Fair competition. But you're eating proper Cornish pasties. That's because we're visiting from the north. Ah. And we get Greg's all the time. So it's a change for the norm for us. Mate. But not everyone has been so accommodating. Greg's has tried before to conquer Cornwall. Each time, the locals have objected, boycotted, forcing one branch to close down. Well, Greg's are downplaying the opening. There is already a Greg's location in Launceston and at Cornwall Services, they say. But now, residents of Truro will also be able to enjoy tasty bakes and sweet treats from Greg's. But when it comes to tasty bakes, there's only one contender on people's minds. Anne Muller has been selling pasties since the 80s. Well, uh, I learned to make a pasty at my mother's knee and uh, <clears throat> my grandparents on both sides made pasties. Uh, it was just, uh, oh, you know, um, well, the staple diet of the Cornish, I suppose. You know, you wouldn't go without a pasty for a week. It's a family firm. Anne's son, Fergus, is in charge of pasty promotion. All of our ingredients within the pasty, other than the pepper, is within 10 miles of us. Um, the, uh, the reasons for this is for the animal welfare. The animal shouldn't travel. The animal, you should know where your meat comes from. It's massively important. Um, and you know, the, and if you, you're getting the rest of the, past, the ingredients for the pasty, it's good for our economy. They say competition is healthy, but many say there's only room for one pasty maker in town. Greg's are up for the challenge and will be keeping a careful eye on footfall before expanding further into the county. But any plans for expansion could see the pasty wars turning nasty. Jeff Moody, GB News. Well, I hope you enjoyed that pasty war interlude as much as I did. Now back to the world of politics. The government has agreed to water down housing targets for local councils to placate Tory rebels. Nearly 60 rebels had pledged to back a plan to ban mandatory targets in England, delaying votes on the levelling up bill. Housing Secretary Michael Gove has now offered councils more flexibility over meeting the government set target. Russell, let's speak now to property expert Russell Quirk. Russell, how significant is this watering down of this bill? Good morning. From pasties to patsies, I might add. Um, those patsies being the 60 backbenchers that basically now seem to control the government into yet another spiralling U-turn. Look, this is really significant, actually, because, you know, say what you like about the, the, the kind of political ideology of the, the state dictating what we should and shouldn't do, and that I'm certainly not for that overall. But what I am for is a direction of travel and an aspiration when it comes to building the right amount of houses, which, frankly, we haven't done since the 1950s, Emily, since the Macmillan government. So Michael Gove now kind of acquiescing to backbench NIMBYs, which is effectively what the likes of Pretty Patel, Theresa Villiers and uh, the likes are, uh, all it's going to result in is obviously less houses being built across the country. Um, that is no good at all for particularly first-time buyers that want to get their foot on the first rung of the property ladder. Not only will it reduce choice, and, and by my estimation, we'll probably see about 50% fewer houses built as a consequence of this, this Gove move, uh, but also 
inevitably what it's going to do is to increase house prices because demand is distinct. Demand is not going away in terms of a growing population, a growing need. Uh, and if we slice house building in half, all that's going to do is to imbalance the market even further and send us into an, another era of unsustainably high house prices that will push first-time buyers and others, and renters actually, uh, out of the way and cause a further accentuation of the housing crisis. Yes, in uh, Barking, Essex, you can no longer uh, get a studio flat for less than £1,200 a month, which is quite extraordinary. Um, but no offence to Barking, Essex, of course. But let me put the NIMBY side, as you might call it. There are many areas of this country where housing developments go up on the periphery of those towns and uh, villages, villages, it, villages, and the infrastructure just isn't there. People are no longer able to get their first choice, second choice, third choice of school for their child. Uh, the roads are far more congested. You can't get a GP's appointment. Does there not need to be more assurance from the government if they want to get Britain building that that infrastructure will be there? Yeah, so infrastructure is obviously very important, and infrastructure is dealt with by way of what they call Section 106 agreements. So when a development of a reasonable size is muted at planning application stage, then the local authority and the developer get together and agree what those Section 106 financial commitments from the developer are going to be. So things like schools, a railway station, further road infrastructure, and so on. Uh, that tends to only happen, though, unfortunately, with, with sizable developments, you know, developments of maybe 50 or 100 units plus. But ironically, of course, Emily, they're also the very developments that the NIMBYs, whether it be MPs or Middle England Shire NIMBYs that live in, you know, um, live in kind of uh, streets that they don't wish to be opposed by housing. That they're exactly the developments that the NIMBYs oppose. The, 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 I'm all for localism, as Eric Pickles kind of coined it back in the day, and I'm all for communities having a say, but that system already exists, and that is through electing local councillors that sit on planning committees that represent their residents and make grown-up big-picture decisions. What we can't have is pressure from a minority of MPs saying that actually mm -hmm. what you end up with is no grand or significant development in areas simply because most people that are twitching their curtains looking at the kind of the horrors of a development being built behind them, they simply are going to say no and we will end up with far, far less housing and we will be catapulted into a crisis. Russell, thank you very much for joining us this morning to give your perspective on the housing crisis and that bill that's been watered down. Property expert Russell Quirk joining us this morning. Now, thank you very much. That's all we have time for. Wow, that went very quickly indeed. Coming up, it's of course, it's Bev Turner today. But first, let's get the weather. Hello, a very good morning to you. I'm Aidan McGiven. It's a cold start out there once again, but it's going to turn even colder during the next few days as northerly winds arrive. However, those northerly winds will bring some brighter skies compared with the last few days. We're going to lose the cloud cover. Clearer spells coming through behind this cold front, which marks the boundary between the chilly and cloudy easterlies and the brighter but even colder northerlies. So things are brightening up during the morning and afternoon. The cloud peeling away from the south coast to reveal plenty of sunshine for southern England, parts of Wales, northern and western England, as well as western Scotland and northern Ireland. I think the north of Scotland, eastern England, parts of northern Ireland will continue to see some cloud and showers brought in on these strengthening northerly winds. Hill snow for northern Scotland and four or five Celsius here, with that wind feeling more like zero or one degree. Seven or eight further south, less windy, a bit more sunshine, perhaps feeling a bit more pleasant compared with the last couple of days. But under those clear skies, temperatures dropping like a stone overnight. Western Scotland, parts of Western England, Wales, Northern Ireland, seeing a widespread frost. Minus three, minus four Celsius in sheltered spots and even lower than that in some prone areas. But for Northern Scotland, Eastern England and Northern Ireland, a bit more cloud about, frost a bit more limited. However, there are going to be further showers here, and as those northerly winds bite, it's going to be snow. For northern Scotland, that's snow falling at all levels, and it looks like at lower levels, 2 to 5 centimetres will build up on Wednesday. 5 to 10 over the hills could cause some problems. Snow warning in force. A mixture of rain and hill snow for eastern England, northern Ireland, and actually these showers will be hit and miss. Plenty of sunshine away from the showers across central and southern parts of the UK. 
although it will feel increasingly cold. We're going to see sharp frosts by night, icy patches in the mornings as well, and some more snow to come for northern Scotland. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Join me, Lawrence Fox, on GB News. Frank. Fun, fearless, and sometimes serious, much as I love a Friday night punch up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. Every Friday at 7 p.m. on GB News. Hello, I'm Esther McVeigh. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news,